Hello, my name is Robert Perry, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Soon, the UN Security Council will consider renewing sanctions against Liberia. We believe that failure to renew these sanctions would be a serious setback to efforts to secure peace in the Mono River region. Liberia's President, Charles Taylor, bears responsibility for the region's long, brutal conflicts and for the infamous Revolutionary United Front, RUF, in Sierra Leone. His resources and agents have prolonged those conflicts. The Security Council imposed sanctions to compel Taylor to stop these activities. The United Nations has invested heavily in this effort, including establishing in Sierra Leone the largest UN peacekeeping force in the world, UNAMSIL. Numerous UN agencies are helping refugees and displaced persons who are victims of the conflict. With this massive investment of United Nations effort and assets, there has been progress towards peace. Faced with UNAMSIL's strength and determination, most RUF fighters in Sierra Leone have disarmed. But the peace is fragile and the gains are not irreversible. Some RUF combatants have regrouped in Liberia despite the Security Council's demand that Taylor expel them. The UN panel of experts on Liberia reports that Taylor continues his trafficking in arms in defiance of the Security Council. The United States condemns the senseless fighting that has plagued the Mano River region and calls upon all parties to support efforts to stop the fighting and secure the peace. We support political change through peaceful means and believe that peace can best be achieved by extending the sanctions on Liberia. The film you are about to see presents images of the conflict in the region and the voices of those who know the cost of war. Let's listen to these voices as we consider the roads to peace in the Mono River region. RUF meets media, they ask me, they say now we're going to kill all of you here in this house. So we apologize to them, they said that they can't accept, unless that they kill all of we in the house. So they take we, we more than 100, they put we in her house, they set a fire on we. So we start to fetch the fire, so we out the fire, so they take we outside, they make a line. One line for the woman and one line for a man. They fire all of the men. All of the men die. So we the woman, some, some rebels have a hacks and a matches, a knife, a small weapon. They tell me that now we come and amputate your legs and your hands so that you can tell Shijan Kaba we don't want any democracy in our country. We are here in the countries that form the Mano River Basin, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, charged with the grim task to present the stories of the individuals whose lives were violated and forever shattered over the past decade by relentless civil wars. Since the war, I'm not nowhere about my family. Since 1990, I don't know where about my mommy and my daddy. Up to now, I'm discouraged. I'm trauma traumatized. I'm very sorry that you know, I left my family behind. Young boys at the edge of tight it down. They collected and they slaughtered everyone in there. Il y a eu 375 personnes prises en otage par les rebelles. Ces personnes-là étaient enfermées au niveau des mosquées. Et là aussi, les femmes étaient violées dans ces lieux, dans ces lieux, dans ces maisons de Dieu. Les jeunes filles étaient violées. You have seen the footage of war. You have heard the news reports of the death tolls. What has changed since the 1960s when a mostly forgotten war first broke out and diamonds came to be the political football for West African leaders? For many, the real question is, what has remained the same in the region? Since the 60s, a highly criminalized war economy has been building with a frightening momentum. Can the news of a lasting peace be real? Or is it wishful thinking? 
Because it is imperative not to become immune to a situation that continues to infect the region, we went from refugee camps to diamond mines and to destroyed towns to meet new refugees, diamond miners, returnees, all those that man's atrocities have permanently scarred. For they are the private citizens and innocent laypersons caught in the crossfire of power. <laughs> The Mano River Basin is cradled in beauty and natural resources. For years, these countries, linked through proximity, cultural identities and tribal heritages, lived in peace. But the sub-region has been widely subjected to abuses. And in the end, it is the very abundance of its natural resources, timber, bauxite, gold and diamonds, to name a few, that has become the region's problems. Wealth has brought a most voracious greed and corruption, one that has dangerously worn the cloak of leadership. And over the past decade, a burgeoning proliferation of motley forces, both official and underground, instilled fear and distrust among the populace, muddying the understanding of who has done what to whom. All have become victims. Ian Smiley, research coordinator of Partnership Africa-Canada, served as a United Nations Security Council expert in 2000. In fact, a lot of writers have said that the wars in Liberia and Sierra Leone are part of some kind of primordial, historical, ancient, ethnic hatreds. It's not that. The real impetus behind all of this is power and money. In 1989, Charles Taylor began his rise to power, instilling fear and coercing Liberians to give him the presidency. Having trained in Libya, he became expert in terrorist maneuvers designed to destabilize Liberia. Then he taught Fode Sanko and the revolutionary United Front, the RUF, to do the same in Sierra Leone. So in 1991, the RUF attacked across the border from Liberia into Sierra Leone. And within three years, they had control of the diamond areas. And so a new war began across the border, with horrendous acts of violence being carried out by another species of victims, the infamous RUF rebels. My own experience is that he had all thieves behind him. Bandits, very wicked people. Because uh, I didn't see why he even started the revolution. Because uh, the majority of the people in Sierra Leone never grumbled that we had a rotten system. I want to tell you, really, that he was on a very selfish note. He came up with this fight on a selfish note, just to enrich himself. While innocent people have paid dearly. Case brûlé, 276. Véhicules enlevé. So many insurgencies were followed by contrite promises of peace. But history shows that the peace was always short-lived. had to go through a lot of uh, difficulties uh, because of broken promises. Uh, one such broken promise was that um, I knew that there were, the rebels were approaching Freetown. And uh, I knew also that uh, Charles Taylor had some influence over the rebels. So I sent, asked my vice president to go there and see him. And he went and they spoke. He was, the vice president was well received. They extended all courtesies to him. And um, then, um, um, at the end of it all, Charles Taylor said, look, tell President Kaba that 
He gave him a date, which was about two weeks from that time. He said, on that date, I think everything will be okay. Everything will be settled in Sierra Leone. That was the day that those people attacked Freetown. To reach its aim, the RUF armed and drugged an army of mostly young men. They were young boys who knew little or nothing for what they were fighting and who were given no choice but to destroy or be destroyed. They came along and joined and served in different capacities, maybe cooking or bringing in wood to cook and whatnot. And they are around. And one of the things that we, we do for them right now, even though they bear arms, uh, their school, their welfare, some they have no parents, they have nobody. And we keep them around as a means of making sure that they are not involved in mischief because of the experiences. And some of these kids went out and fought if we wanted them to go or not. Ninety percent of the roof are unadequated. They don't know why they are fighting for. Like uh, the initial stage when they took up arms, they said they came around to fight for us. But we did not tell them to fight for us. We had everything at the time. They were just you know, ravaging, killing, maiming, doing all lot of atrocities amongst the civilians. As one observer described an amputee camp in Sierra Leone, if you have a soft heart, you will cry. The date, January 6, 1999, is burned in the minds and hearts of the amputees. A too delicate term for the atrocities inflicted through the systematic severing of limbs by the RUF rebels. These people now struggle to piece their lives together, a generation physically and emotionally scarred. And though they hope for reconciliation, their oppressors are still at large. Of course, they do come to this camp, pass on through here, look at us, some of them would tend to provoke us, but we would tell them, man, now that we have come to the, to the, to the peace time, we don't need provoking. You, 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 you can now see what you have done to us, but if you come with provoking, well, you will get us hot. Yet, Charles Taylor continues to provoke instability and mock the international community. Though there is a clear evidence that he's harboring one of the most dangerous RUF accomplices, Sam Bokery, he continues to deny it vigorously. In response, uh, Charles Taylor said to me, he said, look, please, can you give me a number of security people, send him to Liberia, I will provide transportation and all the logistics they need and uh, to search through the country and you will believe that this man is no longer in Liberia. And uh, I initially I didn't respond and then he repeated it again. And then the second time I said, look Charles, there's no need for me to do something like this, for uh, so that um, you will feel that I believe you. What we have to do is, we have to walk towards the situation whereby I say something and you believe me, and you say something and I believe you. Without routing out the source of this oppression, the children's future looks just as bleak. Schools that once educated the young and an infrastructure that once supported the population is gone. A once productive people no longer have the means to help itself. For Allah and Nabi. Recently, along with the UN-imposed ban on imports of diamond from Liberia and on Charles Taylor's international travel, a tenuous peace again has been struck in the Mano River Basin. The Rabat Peace Accord, spearheaded by King Mohammed VI of Morocco, offers new hope for the region. But it is only a first step in otherwise precarious footing. And with their dark memories of war, few of the region's citizens have confidence that the accord will last. It's not a peace accord. That peace accord is not involved. So long Taylor is in Liberia, there is no peace for the Maribo Union. I swear to God, there is no peace. <laughs> Taylor will call them, say something to them. 
When he come by, he do different thing. That's the kind of man. Don't underestimate that young man. He can do anything. To change the human mind about this situation, it doesn't happen overnight. And this is why sometimes I'm so extra tolerant that uh, people think, oh, well, they mistake it for weakness, but it is not that. It's just that, uh, that um, you can't put out fire with fire. Now, fellow refugees are just tuning to our radio, radio station. FM. With today's prospect of peace, however small, Sierra Leoneans and Guineans are returning home. Recent internal fighting in Liberia, however, is again displacing still more innocent civilians. Guinea and Sierra Leone have worked closely with UNHCR to settle thousands of refugees and displaced persons in Guinea. Six camps have been established and plans are in action to build more. But as refugees from Liberia continue to stream back into Guinea and Sierra Leone, their path is not a simple one. Corruption still reigns. It is said that arms are beginning to cross Liberian borders illegally despite the UN embargo. The violence of the war in Guinea between September 2000 and mid-2001 did not attract the attention of the international community. The media were obsessed by the sensationalism of the plight of the amputees in Sierra Leone. The fact is that the attacks launched by the RUF from Sierra Leone and Liberia have caused terrible destruction. They forced Guineans out of their homes and spurred over 75,000 Sierra Leoneans to take refuge in Guinea. The United Nations called the situation there the worst refugee crisis in the world. The motivation behind the attacks is part of a political strategy to destabilize the Mano River region. It's 14 hours they are entered at the house, they have defended them. So they have... Those who were in the room, they have killed them. They said, uh, you want Tyler or uh, Lansana Conte? I did it like that. I said, to tell those who were in the room, say Tyler. I didn't know which Tyler it was. You want Tyler or... Lance en a compté. Ah, c'est Tyler. Donc, il fallait dire le mot qu'il voulait. Tous ceux qui sont venus nous attaquer ont franchi les frontières du Liberia et de la Sierra Leone pour attaquer la Guinée. Donc, quand on nous parle d'un impact de Charles Taylor, comment contredire Puisque c'est là même qui nous ont attaqué, dont nous avons fait plus, prisonniers plusieurs d'entre eux qui ont eu à déposer, reconnaissaient de leur comme provenance le Liberia via la Sierra Leone pour attaquer la Guinée. Donc ce sont des preuves... Ce sont pour nous des, des preuves irréfutables. Despite the rhetoric, Charles Taylor's ultimate long-term personal economic objectives are to amass enormous amount of money. Acquiring diamond mines and logging in pristine forests are his major sources of revenue. He and his cronies, however, are defiant. This government has never, from the history of Liberia till now, the government of Liberia has never involved in the, itself in the purchase, sale and distribution of diamond and gold. The logging companies that are operating now have operated in Liberia over the past 10 years. And in fact, they've had such a hard time that we have, we continue to lose a lot of money. You ask any of them. We were talking about diamond smuggling and all these kind of big news which of course up to today the Liberian government has kept asking the United Nations and those accusers to submit evidence or proofs and up to this hour I haven't seen any proof you know that uh, would merit Liberia being sanctioned. Charles Taylor said in response to our United Nations report he said where is the proof? He keeps saying this he says that all the time. Where is the proof? In other words, where is the proof that I'm dealing with diamonds? Well, nobody has his bank accounts. Nobody can check, uh, can check his financial statements. Those are not things that he makes available to very many people. But he seems to think that nobody has, has been watching Liberia. Uh, we had somebody from Interpol on our panel. We had access to Interpol files. We uh, spoke to intelligence services in Excuse me. We spoke to intelligence services in Britain, uh, in France, in Israel, uh, in West Africa, and uh, other countries. We spoke to police. Uh, there's a, there is a large dossier on Charles Taylor. 
Charles Taylor rejects all evidence out of hand, accusing the appointed expert panel as a foreign plot to get him. If it's a plot, it's a plot. It's, it's, it's many, many, many people interested in seeing him run his government in a, in a more responsible manner and start paying attention to his own problems at home instead of fueling wars in other countries. Eventually, nobody wants to be in Liberia. Nobody wants to stay in there. Nobody here you ask to go back will be willing to go back. That conflict is not going to be a conflict that we expect to finish now. As long as Chancellor is in the realm of power, nobody is expected to expect that conflict to finish. Because we have been promised for the past three years that he is going to put things under control. Surprisingly, myself, I never expected that I will find myself here. Soon, the UN Security Council will be asked to vote on renewing the embargo on the Liberian president. We must ask ourselves, can this man really be trusted? Can we hand over the fragile freedom of the people in the region? Or will Charles Taylor, as the victims' stories suggest, still continue to curse the Mano River? How much more suffering can these innocents bear? <laughs> They amputate our leg because of democracy. I know that I lost my leg forever. So that is, I get my story. So that is all, I think.